Cursed panels. Hugo Strange, waxing poetic, drink in hand to a scantily clad mannequin wearing a Batman cowl. Yes, that's a mannequin. There are layers to this image. And it comes from an arc that, while it can veer into exploitation territory, also had some strong moments of depth. Psychological contemplation and provides a truly menacing and unhinged Hugo Strange. I'm Sasha, this is Casually Comics, and this is the Cursed Panel series, where we provide context to some out there panels. We've done a bunch of these at this point. Hank Pym slap, Power Girl licks Superman's face, and more, many more. Now the aforementioned panel often floats around. It's presented as a WTF moment, or a wow, what a freak you of strange is moment. And while yes, those sentiments are applicable, there's also a lot more going on. So let's dive in. This panel comes from the series Batman Legends of the Dark Knight oftentimes just called Legends of the Dark Knight, the first run because there have been a couple of iterations of this. The first one launched in 1989 after the popularity and success of the Tim Burton Batman film, which also championed a darker and at the time it was darker version of Batman on screen compared to the 1960s version that had come before. So that darker tone would come to be known to the general public. Now while in comics Batman had been already trending that way, this film helped cement that and so it would allow things to be pushed even further at times in the comics. But we'd already had The Dark Knight Returns by this point. The Dark Age was upon us. This series reflected that sentiment, at least at the start. It was initially comprised of long, often five issue arcs set early in Batman's career. Lots of times reimaginings of some of the earliest happenings. The arc our panel comes from is entitled Prey, and it was later collected as a graphic novel under that same name. It was initially released in 1990 through 1991, and it consists of issues 11 to 15. It was written by Doug Mensch, with art by Paul Guasi, Terry Austin on inks, and colors by Steve Olive. And it's a lot of a lot. It centers largely around the first confrontation between Hugo Strange and Batman, which is very fitting as Hugo Strange debuted in Detective Comics 36 in 1940, making him one of Batman's first recurring villains. He also featured in Batman number one in 1940. Now when Hugo Strange was initially conceived of, he was a mad scientist and criminal mastermind. There's also a great ghost storyline, but now is not the time. This arc, Prey, would be the reintroduction of the character post-Crisis on Infinite Earths. And this introduction would shift him in a way, combining many of the previous elements but wrapping them all up under the character of a corrupt psychiatrist obsessed with Batman, abusing his position and power while also succumbing to his own demons. This story has a lot to offer and is foundational for how many view Hugo Strange. However, it also contains some elements that would lead some to reject it outright because some feel that it goes a bit gratuitous in some aspects. It is very of its era, which includes grit and edge, and for some that lands and for others it doesn't. In a way that energy mirrors some of the original golden age, some of that grit from the 1940s, and so it marries well with a throwback to Batman's early days in that way, but not all may agree. This story also features the beginning of the solidification of Captain Gordon at the time, and Batman's relationship, Batman meeting Catwoman, the creation of the Bat Signal, and the Batmobile, and all the Hugo Strange stuff. So there's a lot going on in these five issues. It's definitely worth a read. It's very dense and interesting. And we're not going to be able to capture all the nuance here because we're going to focus on Hugo Strange for the purpose of this panel. If we didn't, we'd be here forever. Maybe another type. But as for this panel, how do we get there? Issue 11, go! Look at that cover. It's a great one. Very atmospheric. Simple, but gorgeous. Right away we set the tone in its seedy late 80s, early 90s action movie. A drug deal that's a secret sting. Batman busting in so that he can get some information. The title of the arc, Prey Embedded on the Theater Marquee, an adult theater marquee, based on where they are. From the start, you know what type of story this is about to be. Dirty Harry or Charles Bronson could slot right in here, but we've got Batman instead. Here, I'm done with him. Your turn now. And he wonders why Gotham PD doesn't like him. Not that we should be too concerned about that because it's Gotham and they're very corrupt. This series employs a technique wherein the narration or some description will bleed into the next scene with a new character. They'll finish off each other's thoughts and take it in a new direction. The logic works for a man operating outside the law before a cop, Sergeant Court, I'll have to remember him and his attitude. Bad for morale of the force, Captain Gordon, and we've got to stop it once and for all. So you see we segued from Batman thinking about Court to Court talking about Batman. So it's very slick, it does work, but they do it all the time in the first couple of issues, so it gets to be a bit much. It wears out its welcome a teensy teensy bit, but as the arc goes on, they ease back on it. However, when it is employed, they do it well. So the setup is there's tension between Batman and the police, and he's so new that he isn't even always called Batman. They called him Man Bat in some of these panels, so it's very early days. It's before all the other villains have shown up, which is very in keeping for when Hugo Strange arrived on the scene in the Golden Age. So it's managing to be interwoven with what happened in the 1940s without having to explicitly reference it, but it's flowing naturally with what occurred there. Updating Batman's history in a very credible and intelligible manner. The one cop who's kind of sorta on his side is Captain Gordon, because he saved his daughter and they kind of are building their relationship, but they're not to that level of trust that they will have later on. In moving out of urban legend status, Batman is starting to make 
waves. And not everybody is in full support. It's leading to discussions of should there be a Batman and what can they do about him. And one such is taking place on television, which is where we get our first glimpse of Hugo Strange. It's a discussion between the mayor, Captain Gordon, and Hugo Strange on the Batman. This television sequence, which an injured Bruce is watching at home, is extremely effective. As Strange starts to dive into his analysis of Batman, who he is, what must have happened to him, Bruce listens, wanting to see if Strange says anything that's relevant to him. Doctor Strange, perhaps that falls into your area of expertise. What do we know about this Batman? Well, psychologically speaking, I should say he is extremely obsessed and he craves individual power, indicating a paranoid mistrust of others. An expert. Shall I switch it off, sir? Free analysis, Alfred? No. One thing that can quickly be seen is that Doctor Strange isn't entirely off base. Gonna say Doctor Strange and images of Stephen Strange are gonna pop up, even though he is called Doctor, but you gotta differentiate, otherwise the internet is gonna give you the Marvel character. The thing is, a lot of what he says is applicable. It's just presented through a very twisted lens. At the same time, the television host is trying to ramp up tensions, you know, for ratings. And so he's kind of pitting this analysis against the police, saying that they're making the police look bad. And as this is going on, Strange uses it as an opportunity to dig deeper. Obsessed with all of it, I should say. And a lot more obsessed with the night, with darkness, perhaps obsessed with vengeance. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he or a loved one proved to be a victim of crime, a crime committed in darkness. Indeed, the very genesis of this tormented figure might well be traced back to the traumatic events of a single key night, a night that haunts him and may well haunt him forever. Crunch glass breaking. Sir, are you sure you should? I said leave it on, Alfred. You also mentioned the obsession with individual power. Why? Well, that's obvious. He hasn't chosen to join the police, has he? All of this gets to Bruce so much that he breaks the glass that he's holding because some of it's hitting. Which, while it may not be intentional, harkens back to Strange's first appearance. We're in a rage after reading about Batman interrupting one of his operations. He breaks a glass. It's probably me reading too much into it, but if so, again, that would be a great link. I hope that someone thought about it that much. So from looking at these exchanges, we the reader can glean two things. One, this is getting to Bruce. And two, again, Strange isn't entirely wrong, which helps to position him as a dangerous and cunning antagonist and also gives the reader some things to ponder. It also plays into that age old question for Batman of does he create the villains he fights? I'm lingering on the sequence because it's so effective and also it presents us with Strange, which is gonna be important because this presentation here is gonna contrast later with when we get to the mannequin. There is the public persona of Strange and then there's the private version where gonna get to see. We get to see both. We're on the inside. In this exchange, Gordon is here to provide a counterpoint, and he also has some valid things to bring up. The man's a pompous ass. How can anyone even listen to him? Why am I here? He does not wish to share his victories and accomplishments, yet he insists on remaining anonymous, you see. He craves fame, wants to be a star, but not as himself, only as this fictional construct, the Batman. This, of course, indicates both schizophrenia and a split personality. No. Again, so many layers and different ways to look at the characters. The slight foreshadowing and hints of what is happening with Strange here, which is that his own obsessions and feelings towards Batman are clouding his analysis. Not enough to make him entirely wrong, but enough to make him slightly off base and to apply some of his own pathos on top of Batman. He identifies with Batman, so he's applying some of his traits onto him, but then reverse engineering that into his diagnosis. And as this goes on, he starts to go more more and more off the rails. Just look at this image he's chosen. The iconography of a hideous, filthy night creature like the bat. Clearly he exults in the dark power of this terrifying apparition too. Oh, for pity's sake, he just wants to scare the pants off criminals. This is just one sequence and it goes on for a little bit, but it's one in this arc and it's very complex and this arc is full of moments like this. They really make you think about the concept of Batman in a fun way while creating a truly dangerous foe for Batman and exploring some of how someone in Strange's position can really abuse his authority and be dangerous, especially when he is revered and has credibility. He's viewed as someone who's an expert in his field and he moves in the same circles as Bruce Wayne, which means he has to encounter him in both personas. It lays a very firm groundwork and foundation for their confrontation. This broadcast culminates in a task force being formed and Gordon having to head it up, but also Strange is gonna be a consultant on it, which he is thrilled for for several reasons. One, that he wants to write a book and get himself some clout, get that fame and some money. That's just one though. He also is genuinely obsessed with Batman and he even says as much, but people don't really take it that seriously, again, because of how he presents himself. All of this explores an off not discussed side of the psychological field, the quest for 
fame, money, and acclaim, which can corrupt because people in this profession are still people. It can lead to all kinds of things like people exploring and pushing their own kind of diagnostics so that they can get funding and all kinds of things. It's a very interesting avenue that isn't often explored because people don't want to malign or add more stigma, but there are many stories there. You can do both, positive and negative. Lots of stories. Here with Strange, you can see what happens if a manipulative person takes on such a role. Diagnosis, Mr. Mayor, not theories. And before I venture any further, deductions, I must first insist on full access to all police files. Everything known about the vigilante's tactics, methods, and times and places of activity. Strain seeks to go above Gordon and instead respond directly to the mayor. And in doing so, misses some crucial information that Gordon actually has. And because he knows this, he's able to hide it from him. Because Strain is only looking for victims of violent crimes from the past five years. He's deduced that Batman must have experienced something traumatic, but he assumes it's the loss of a child or loss of a wife. And so he's not looking as far back as Gordon knows that he should because it's hinted that Gordon already knows who Batman is. Because when he receives the request for the files to only go back five years, he breathes a sigh of relief that Strange underestimated Batman's lifetime obsession, as he calls it. We're treated to the inner thoughts of all the characters and seeing them both in their public spaces and their private spaces in this. You get to have a lot of breadth and range and get to see some real depth in all of them. And so it is in issue one near the end that we got our first glimpse of the mannequin in Strange's apartment. She's sitting there, dressed up, listening to him, and it's clearly a regular occurrence that he just takes her out in the evenings and just pontificates upon his day in front of her. He's fascinating, you know, plays by none of the rules, acting when he wants and how he wants, clearly disdaining authority. It's easy to dismiss this as an attempt at shock value and titillation. And while there's a bit of that there, there's more here. It's meant to show us several things about Strange, things that will just be built upon as the story goes on. We see his disdain for others, his need to be the smartest person in the room, and his deep-seated resentment towards women and viewing them as solely objects. They need to be quiet, sit there, look pretty, and just listen to him. He doesn't want to hear them. But this mannequin and these scenes visually represent that, while also cluing the reader in that Strange isn't entirely stable, but can also present a solid approximation of being so to the public, just like Bruce. So there's some similarities there. Enough to make some uncomfortable parallels and really make you think about this relationship, a dark mirror type situation, which makes this a fascinating reading experience. Strange has even made his own bat costume, and yeah, he gets in it. In some paralleling, we see Batman clashing with the task force now in place to get him, headed by Sergeant Court, who Gordon shows in hopes that he would be ineffective, but is actually really aggressive about it because he hates Batman so much. While this is happening, we see Strange don his Bat costume. Oh, he's a killer, this Batman. A killer who doesn't kill, free to run rampant through the deep secret darkness, making red love to the night itself. Oh, how I envy him. Oh, how I hate him. It's in part two or issue 12 that we get our cursed panel. This part's called Dark Sides. I, I can share his mind, <laughs> but not his body. I can know how it feels to be the Batman psychologically, but not, not physically. God, how I envy him. How I hate him. And you, what are you looking at? You think it's funny? You enjoy seeing me humiliated? You think I'm not as good as the real Batman? Stop staring at me. Stop laughing. The feel of violence, the sharp pain of a struck blow. I wonder when he smashes their faces, when he mixes his blood with theirs, does he feel it? Probably not. As the story goes on from this moment, we just see Strange get more and more obsessed and hyper-focused on the Batman, fixated. The closer he gets to Batman and finding out who he is, the worse it gets. He particularly spirals when he encounters people who approve of Batman or his methods, such as when meeting Bruce, who's firmly in his Brucey persona, so Strange doesn't clock him. He meets the mayor's daughter, Catherine, who admires Batman and not Strange, and that will send him spiraling. This will lead to a series of events that show his insidious, calculating nature. He asks Catherine out on a date because he wants to prove to her that he's a bigger man. She doesn't know this, but th we, the reader, know because we're seeing all the inner stuff. He also launches a psychological campaign against Batman by trying to destroy his reputation, turn public opinion against him, not for any principled reason, but just to hurt the Dark Knight and make himself feel better. Now, before he launches into all of this, we get our cursed panel. It's part of the ramp up, the escalation of Strange's descent. I consider it an improvement, my dear, and certainly better than losing your head again, eh? <laughs> but as I was saying, these are difficult times indeed. Ding dong, plot. Note the subtle infusion of sex over this whole bat obsession, but also that anger towards women all wrapped up in it. It's complex. The thing is, 
all of the underlayers on the undertones can be easy to overlook because of how it's presented. It could come across as gratuitous, but in the actual context, it's working to accent the work's themes. Now, other parts of these stories do veer towards the rated R type of content, just cause it can. So you'll see some very scantily clad people and some violent situations. You'll see some things that if I were to show them, you have to censor because even though it's nighttime, they're pointy and YouTube doesn't like nipples on Catwoman or anybody. Now for some of these moments undermine all of the other things going on in this arc, while for others it won't matter or it will match with the vibe the story is going for. It's just worth noting cause there's a lot one could hide highlight with prey, both positive and negative. In my estimation, the scales tip towards the positive, but miles may vary. This panel comes near the end of the issue where the head of the task force, Court, who has turned against Gordon for seeing him summon Batman with the newly created Bat Signal, brings Strange the files. The Bat Signal is a secret, by the way. The mannequin also does more in this story later on, aside from gets head knocked off and sit there with a bat cowl on. In a confrontation between Batman and Strange, Strange knocks its head off and it's full of hallucinogens, which he's able to use to get Batman to reveal core things about his trauma, which point him in the direction of Bruce Wayne. And Bruce was already amped up because of all the things Strange was doing. It was getting to him. And the mannequin also does more on a thematic level. It was foreshadowing. When Strange's date with Catherine goes awry and he ends up having her kidnapped by Court, who he has brainwashed under the guise of helping him become a more effective task force leader to get Batman, but instead he stokes his desire to be better than him and hence creates another vigilante. The Night Scourge. I know. Tell me it's the 90s without telling me it's the 90s. Night Scourge away. Once he has had her kidnapped, he trusses her up in the bed and gags her. And like the mannequin, forces her to listen to him and she can't say anything, it's just to sit there. It's the exact same energy. And as it goes on, we get even more of that repressed sexual element because now he's wearing the costume but without the head and so it's kind of paralleling what was going on before. It's all very uncomfortable. The atmosphere of the story itself, the slow build, the peeling back of the layers as to what a damaged and threatening man Strange is. Imagine being tied to this bed, trapped in here with this man who's respected by your father, who you know that people believe is doing all this good work for the city. You know no one's coming for you and then he's just here ranting at you getting more and more unhinged. It's genuinely very well done and terrifying. The atmosphere, the coloring, it really puts you into the this is scary headspace. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Although this is one of the elements some don't enjoy for that very reason, feeling it perpetuates and condones violence against women, while others feel it's in service of the narrative or that there's a distinction to be drawn between fiction and reality, or that it's not presented as a positive by any means. However, some counter it adds to a history of poor depictions of women in the genre and perpetuates female victimhood. You can tell me how you feel about it down below. As for Strange, the threat he presents continues to be shown. He's also smart. He's able to suss out who Batman is and lay traps to decimate him psychologically. He twists people who come to him for help for his own perverse gains. And all of this in the service of his own damaged psyche. He is able to turn public opinion against Batman. A layered thing because he created the Night Scourge for multiple reasons and that was one of them, to make Batman look bad. He's able to use his connections, get articles run, appear on TV. Wortham vibes. Now of course this doesn't work out for him, but it's a very close thing. In the end, he can't prove that Bruce Wayne is Batman and he ends up making a confession, it's one of those confession scenes, a classic, even Gordon, when Batman comes up with the idea, is like, ah, a classic. They managed to trap him in his own ego. Very poetic, but he came very close. He was very close. Now issues 11 through 13 of this arc are extremely strong. So the rising action, the denouement and the climax, less so. 14 and 15, they're still nuanced and action packed, but at that point, we're getting the bit of the rest wrap it up feeling. Overall, some of the elements feel as though they could have been cut or minimized, and this could have been maybe one issue shorter. We'll leave that for a discussion of Prey and entirety if we ever get to just discussing the arc itself and not specifically this panel because if we were to expand we'd be here for hours there's so much to talk about however it must be noted that all the things that are introduced are utilized inside of the story they come up at some point and they all come together at the end i get way too excited about prey there's just so much going on it's one of those deep psychological stories it gets me really excited and amped up. At the same time, it does have a lot of 90s grit and edge, which sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. In this instance, I feel it works, but you may disagree. Those are just my thoughts and you know I wanna hear yours. So this is where the cursed panel hails from. It owes some of its seeming extraness to the aesthetics and tone of Batman at the time, in addition to appearing in a series that initially touted itself as more adult than your average comic series. However, even with all of that in play, it is set up as an integral piece of the evolving derangement of Hugo Strange. It's serves a clear purpose and the disquieting nature is part of that purpose. It's intentional. Could it have been done another way? Perhaps. However, it also fits in very well with the tone and atmosphere of this story. In fact, it's almost difficult to discuss this panel as an individual panel. It's so entwined with the story and resonates throughout. This entire story flows excellently together and it reads very well as a graphic novel. And yet it also is exciting in parts. It's just very well constructed. Good curse. If you have any time and this sounds like it's up your alley, check it out. In fact, if you like this tone, perhaps checking out the 
first run of Legends of the Dark Knight in general would be a good idea. There's just a lot of stories that are interesting in there. Also, this arc in particular is worth checking out for yourself because there's a lot that I didn't get to touch on. Batman and Gordon's relationship, Batman and Alfred's, Batman and Catwoman. There's so many things going on. Just all of the night skirts. It's a dense work in the best way. However, at the same time, if all of this sounds unappealing, you know what to avoid. Stay away. However, this story is a key one in the evolution of Hugo Strange. It's a solid reintroduction and reinvigoration of a classic character. Even if it is 90s-ing very hard. That's not always a bad thing. The Edge and Grit are only bad if they're untethered and have no purpose. If they actually manage to cohere together, it can be pretty awesome. Look out, here comes the night skirt. But as mentioned, those are just my thoughts and I wanna hear yours. What do you think about Prey? What do you think about this panel? Leave more curious panels down below. Thanks so much for taking some time today I spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it. Like, share, comment, subscribe. More videos as always coming soon and I will see you there. Bye-bye.